Welcome to another edition of the official Jets podcast powered by Amazon Web Services. Ethan Greenberg, Eric Allen, rocking out in the home studios. We have Harvey Longy on the podcast. Of course, Bart Scott joins us later for our Victorinox Swiss Army Knife Player of the Game segment. But whoa, what happened in Southern California that the Jets flew back home with a dub? One of the biggest updates, uh, biggest upsets in modern football history. The New York Jets, a 17 point underdog against the Rams. I didn't see this one coming, Greens. We talked about it heading into the final three weeks of the season. If the Jets were going to get a win, I thought this team had showed uh, propensity to play better at home at MetLife Stadium. So I thought, hey, maybe they could sneak up on the Browns. Or the New England Patriots, who are out of the playoffs for the first time in 2008. You don't know what their lineup's going to be looking like in Week 17. On paper, this looked like an awfully difficult matchup. The number one defense in the National Football League with the Rams. And then a balanced offense. They run the football well. Cam Cam Akers is coming off a great game against the New England Patriots. Jared Goff getting the ball out of his hands to Cooper Cup and Robert Woods and company. So, you got to hand it to the Jets. Bottom line, they faced so much adversity in 2020 and at 0 and 13, when nobody gave them a chance, consider what had happened the two previous weeks the heartbreaker against the Raiders. And then they went out to the West Coast and played the Seahawks 40 to 3 when the offense got nothing going. Wow, they played their best game in all three phases. Yeah, I think you got to give a lot of credit. To everyone in the building, especially the players, of course, who executed what we thought was a good game plan. And just on a lighter note, I wonder how many people across the United States and in the world picked the L.A. Rams in like survivor pools, because I bet you survivor pools got knocked out big time if you chose another team that wasn't the L.A. Rams and they won. Oh, I agree with that, because uh, a lot of folks, you know, are taking the strategy of whoever Jacksonville plays, whoever the New York (laughs) Jets play. Well, it didn't work for a lot of people last week in L.A. You got to give credit to everybody across the board. I thought the defense really set the tone for the game. Quinn Williams continues to play at an elite level. Nathan Shepard filling in for Paul Lorenzo Fadakasi. Bryce Hall with his first career interception. How about special teams? J.T. Hassel? Speaking of prop bets, I wonder if you went to MGM or (laughs) Fed MGM and said on Saturday, I'm taking JT Hassel with the block punt against the Rams. What kind of odds do you would have got on that? Braden Mann, you talked to him after the game, a game-saving tackle uh, on that punt return late. Marcus May making a beautiful pass Mm -hmm. deflection. And then offensively, we were talking about it before we started this podcast. Sam Darnold, really decisive in control, played his best game of the season back home in Southern California. You know, there's a thousand ways that we could skin this cat. We could talk about every highlight of the game. We could talk about individual performances. You mentioned Sam Darnold, but I think I think we should almost kind of focus on the ripple effect here because it's a very polarizing day in Jets Twitter because the Jets won, the players and coaches are happy, and a lot of former NFL players – who are in the media now are happy for the Jets. I I was watching a clip. Pat McAfee was saying he was a part of the Colts team that drafted Andrew Luck, and they were 0-13 or something similar, and they finally got their first win over the Tennessee Titans, and he said it was like it was such a great feeling and went on and described what that was and for him. So he was happy for the Jets. But on the other end of the spectrum for the fans, obviously if you you don't live under a rock, you've seen – that the fans or most fans are upset because of what could happen in April where if Trevor Lawrence decides to declare and right now if the draft were tomorrow, the Jets would not have the number one overall pick. That would be the Jacksonville Jaguars. The bottom line is you never want to be in a situation ever again where the players are celebrating a victory and the fan base is unhappy. And this happens because they're looking out at the draft and they see somebody like, Trevor Lawrence, who a lot of people think he's a generational prospect, like one of the better prospects out there that we've seen in the last 20 or 30 years. But there are two weeks to play some ball. The Jacksonville Jaguars have a home game against the Chicago Bears, who suddenly got hot with Mitch Trubisky at quarterback. Who would have saw that coming? And then who did Jacksonville beat 
in their first game. That was the Indianapolis Colts. Well, they finished the season in, Indiana, in Indianapolis against the Colts. And you've been saying it all along, Greens, who knows what that game is ultimately going to mean for Indianapolis. Maybe they either have the division tucked away or they know they're going to be a wild card the following weekend and maybe they're resting people, things like that. Bottom line is, too, let's look at it from Joe Douglas's perspective. He's trying to develop a culture here. He has filled that locker room with a lot of character players, and we've seen that on display. And when we look ahead to the draft, no matter where the Jets are drafting, they're going to have an early pick. In fact, they have two first-round picks in 2021, which is coming up in April, two first-round picks in 2022. And then what's the number, eight or nine draft picks in the first three rounds over the next two years? And Joe Douglas's first draft class, headlined by his first pick overall, Makai Becton, looks pretty damn good. That is for sure. That is for certain. And when you go down the the list, even the some undrafted guys like Javelin Gidry played 100% of the team snaps against the Rams. And he, he's a player that's really come on as of late. Also, an, a, a official Jet, an official Jets podcast powered by Amazon Web Services alum because he was <laughs> recently on, on our podcast. So I think you've seen the dividends early, which is nice to see for a draft class in its first year, because typically you can't really evaluate a draft class until a couple of years down the road. Well, you're starting to see some early payoff here from guys like like Kai Becton and company. And you said it, the Jets are going to have, I'm pretty sure the Jets are locked into a top three pick based on where we are right now. So the Jets are going to have their opportunity to draft a blue chip player, assuming that the blue chip players declare for the draft that are the underclassmen so on and so forth. And just circling back to that Indianapolis Colts game uh, and the Jaguar situation is, I think you kind of said it, like no one really thought the Jets were going to beat the Rams. So that's really what makes football football. You, We might be sitting here and saying like, oh, I don't know if the Jaguars will win another game, but you just don't know. And everyone says it's real hard to lose 16 in a row, as of course it is, but the Jags won week one, they've lost since. So maybe they're due. Who knows? There's a lot that can happen between now and the end of the season. And then a ton that's going to happen between the end of the season and April's draft. Yeah. And then we don't have the crystal ball of what each of these prospects are going to look like once they enter the national football league and get involved in a new system and acclimate themselves to a new environment. So uh, there's a lot of things that are uncertain right now. We don't know the draft order. We know the Jets are going to have plenty of draft capital. There's no doubt about that. We know that Joe Douglas is one of the most respected personnel men in the National Football League. We know that he's had just one draft. And I make the argument too, Ethan, and I don't know how you feel about this. I never looked at the Jets as an 0 13 team. Parcells is right. Bill Parcells always used to say, you are what your record says you are. But if you really dive deep into the schedule, there are games out there that I thought typically you probably win. That Denver Thursday night game, you couldn't put it away uh, at home a week four. Then it was the Patriots game. You had a lead in the fourth quarter again, unable to close the deal. And then the Raiders game. I mean, that game mm -hmm. was basically locked and sealed, and it just didn't happen. But uh, – you know, you are what your record says you are, so you are 1-13. I just I just think if you watch the Jets play throughout the year, even though historically uh, they've had some bad numbers at times during the year, there were a bunch of games, a few games, I should say, that were out there where I, I thought those probably should have went into the win column. And if you're a fan, again, you're going to get an early pick no matter what happens over the course of the next two weeks and in fact you're going to have two first rounders and you have a ton of draft capital and there are guys here that you like what you're seeing on the field you're seeing players continue to develop and I know those guys as we heard Sunday night they were stoked about having a victory and a lot of these guys are playing for jobs and they're playing for their profession so I would anticipate the Jets to continue to have great efforts over the next Two weeks, win or lose. No doubt. And one player who gives a thousand percent effort, regardless of the result, regardless of the score or the time of the game, that's linebacker Harvey Longy. Without further ado, let's hear from Harvey himself. The season will end 
for the Jets in Foxborough in two weeks. Yeah. Um, when you go back to Foxborough, uh, it, you know, and some people have heard your story and some people haven't, and Ethan just mentioned it. Can you I- explain exactly what happened to you and your wife, Cassidy, and how that changed both of you and has helped you get to this point right now, how you were able to overcome a potentially tragic moment. And I would imagine that brought you even closer together with your wife um, because a lot of people are celebrating Christmas later this week and the world has had seen its share of tough times. But I think we have to hear about a great story of somebody overcoming and your family is a great example of that. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a great, that that's a great question. And that's, you know, I'm willing to share that. So uh, to set up a little, you know, backstory to what was happening, I was undrafted. I made the 53 man roster um, at the, um, at the Patriots. I was undrafted to the Patriots. I made the 53 man roster, but I was playing special teams, but I was going in and out of being active and not active, active and not active. I was more inactive than active and I was activated I think for maybe one or maybe two games I want to say it was probably even one game I don't know but I played special teams and I backed up uh, Kyle Van Noy and Dante Hightower um, and you know some pretty dang good uh, linebackers and, and the Patriots but there was one week it was like week six or week seven where you know uh, the defensive coordinator came up to me and just said hey uh you, you you better be prepared this this week you know i know you're gonna you if we do activate you you'll play special teams but i need you to be prepared uh for some defensive reps due to uh injury at the time and so this week i was taking it as serious as possible i was you know watching extra film i was you know trying to go through all my playbook and going through all the the steps and fundamentals to do the things that you need to do within your playbook and at least once a week, you know, getting this advice from, you know, a lot of uh, men that, you know, are are big into my life. They all say, hey, you know, always set aside a, a time where you can go on a date, you know, when you're married, blah, blah, blah. So uh, every every uh, Tuesday, my wife and I would always go out on a date, but I canceled it this week because I didn't, I wanted to be focused. And about is I think Thursday or fr- no, it's Friday. We get a call from one of our good friends that we're in Foxborough that we, you know, we've built a relationship with since we've been there, hit us up. And they're like, Hey, we're going to go to, we're going to go out to dinner. Do you, do you guys want to go out? And, and, you know, Cass answers the phone. She looked at me and told me the situation. I'm sitting there going through, you know, playbook and stuff. And I'm like, no, it's, no, let's just do it next week. And you can, I could just see it in Cass's face. Like, uh, <laughs> so she's just like no it's fine um you guys go ahead we'll just stay back and i can just you know because she stays home all day every day because she's there to just support me because man it's our first year in the nfl um when i was going to school she graduated um because you know i took those two years on my mission so she graduated because we're the same age so she graduated and worked for a year and a half full time so she was the breadwinner for the the last two years of my uh, college, my college. So this time when I wanted to go in the NFL, I'm like, listen, you just come, let's go on this journey and just do it together. Cause you'll never know. Like if it ends, it ends and we gotta, let's go and do it together. Um, you know, it could be short, it could be long, but let's go ride it out. So she came out there and didn't really have a job. So she's bored all day. She wants to go out. She wants to put on jeans for once and not wear sweats all day, you know? <laughs> so I could see her face. She's like, you guys go it's fine we're just gonna stay here and i'm sitting there and i have this feeling in my gut like gosh like i guess we can go to dinner if we go to this longhorn steakhouse that's literally down the highway you just get on the highway you get off the next exit it's within a mile and i hit i just say hey babe go throw on your jeans let's go call them tell them to meet us at longhorn steakhouse let's go let's hang out you can see the brightness of it. she's so happy i'm like oh, let's go do this whatever it'll be quick and um on our way back home uh we we get on the highway but like it's like a it's like columbia turnpike if if anyone is familiar with uh, that that's you know watching it's like columbia turnpike over here right in form park we get on columbia 
and we're coming back and we stop at the light on the, like we stop at a light on a, a turning arrow to go to just turn and and to get off Columbia to come home. So we're we're almost home. We stop at the red light and I'm trying to find a song on on my phone, you know, it's Bluetooth and my wife's just like by the time you find a song we're going to be home. I don't know why you're even trying. And I hit the song that I find and I'm being annoyed, singing it out loud and just like trying to get her annoyed because I found a song and then boom, like I didn't know what happened. I woke up and all I could see was just red and blue lights, glass everywhere. I was crunched up, like my knees were all the way to my chest. I couldn't, I couldn't move like that that uh that noise that you hear in your ear whenever your eardrums pop or like something loud gets blown in you you know it's like a like a high pitch uh tone is just going in my ears and i'm just like what just happened and i don't even know what's what that what the heck's happening there's a bunch of you know first responders and cops around our our car cutting using the jaws of life to open things up and i turn to my right and cass is you know, she's she's bent over like this, and there's just blood is just going everywhere, and I'm just, I'm I'm trying to just figure out what the heck just happened, and then it just, you know, my my adrenaline hits because like you know I see Cass there bleeding out, and I'm trying to, you know, get you know use all the strength that I have to like get to help her and to do things, but I couldn't because I was so smushed. Um, so a Jeep was coming, you know, 57 miles per hour and smashed into us directly from the back. And there was a car in front of us. So it was just like an accordion. It was just boom, like a sandwich. And and I was just so smushed that I couldn't even help um, her. And she was just, you know, there unconscious and, you know, bleeding. And I just couldn't do anything. And it was probably the craziest and hardest thing that I ever had to go through. And, you know, the first responders and guys are trying to hold me back and calm me down. But, you know, I'm going, you know, I'm trying to be Superman, but I can't do anything because I'm so stuck and my legs are so pinched. Um, and, and then I finally just calmed down because there's two guys just, you know, trying to hold me down the whole time. And I finally just calmed down and, and eventually they take out Cass and I just like, it just hit me like, man, the only way that this could have possibly happened is if I fell asleep because I didn't know what happened at the time. So I'm just freaking out. I think and I, that I fell asleep. You know, I'm they they marked Cass as deceased, but I didn't know that. Um, but they marked her as deceased. I'm sitting there just, you know, freaking out that I just killed maybe my wife. Um, it was just terrifying and just heartbreaking and just like it was the craziest thing that's ever happened to me. I'm just like, holy crap. I can't believe I just fell asleep at the wheel and just basically killed my wife. And, um, um, it was just tough because, you know, they separated us and, and they took us to two different hospitals. So I really couldn't see her and I couldn't hear from her. So, you know, it was probably the darkest moments of my life. Just sitting there and thought for, uh, you know, for those, uh, you know, the time that passed and, um, um, you know, I, I'm calling everyone I can, I'm calling her parents to check on her. I'm calling our church. So, you know, we're part of a church over here, um, and, or over there at the time. So I call the church members cause that's the only people we knew, you know, that was part of the, 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 the couple we went out with, we met them at church. So I'm calling the people from the church to go to the hospital that Cass was at. Um, I called uh, I called her parents, I called everyone that I can to just go check on her, go check on her, everyone. I just try to send as much people over to her as much as possible so I can see if she's okay. And um, um, about uh, like three hours, four hours later, you know, they separated us from hospitals because I guess you don't take two trauma cases at the same hospital. I finally get a call and, you know, it was her and, um, man, once I knew she was alive, man, I didn't care about anything else. I was just like, man, I'll take being alive, you know, like, I know I had probably an opportunity to, you know, get some playing time this, this week. I know that, you know, my career is on the line. I know that, you know, 
this, that, and the other thing that you could be thinking about, but none of that was what I was thinking about. And um, once I knew that we were alive, that's all that mattered. And um, it was crazy too, because that game, Dante Hightower goes out with the torn mm -hmm. pec. Kyle Van Noy gets hurt or something like that. So a practice squad member whose name is Trevor Riley, who's playing special teams, but me and him were, me and him were like on the same level. He starts and he goes out there. He's a good buddy of mine. So shout out to Trevor. He went out there and did his thing. Um, but you know, I sometimes look back at him like, man, that could have been me. I could have been starting for the Patriots that year. And um, anyway, um, we both survived and we both were alive and. Um, it just put a perspective in our both of our minds that, man, the really things that matter in this world aren't, you know, the the uh, the NFL, the money, the the cars, the clothes, the the clout, the, you know, the followers, the likes, this, that and the other thing. The biggest thing that matters, you know, in, in the life for me and my wife were, you know, family and relationships and and memories that you build with, you know, those that you really love and. And, um, and that's, that's what, that's what it brought us back to. It just brought us back to square one. And I, you know, being, being a religious man and also just being a man of, you know, just, uh, a family guy too. And all that, I do truly believe that, you know, it was a, it was something that needed just to reset and to tell me, you know, remind me, uh, what is more important to keep my eyes, you know, focused on things that are important in this life. And, and if you do, and if I did keep those things important and keep those things, you know, um, um, stable and keep those things true, then, um, you know, everything else will fall into place. And um, shoot, right when I knew that both of us were, were alive, man, I, I knew that, gosh, I'm alive. She's alive. I'm going to play football. I don't know how, <laughs> where, now that everything's okay and we're going to be okay and we're going to recover from this someplace somewhere i'm going to be on a football field i might be a coach i might be a freaking strength conditioning coach on that football field i might be a player but i don't know how i'm going to get back on that field i'm going to get back on that field somehow some way and shoot um you know three three and a half four years later man i'm i'm out here doing it again so um super blessed and you know just another lesson to just not take things for granted and to you know hug those that are close to you and uh you know to uh, to tell those that you love, you, you love them, and to tell them that um, on a daily basis, and not take those things for granted. Wow, Su uh, super inspirational. Uh, yeah, it's beautifully told. I don't know if there's much that we can follow up with, and given that it's the holiday spirit, I just want to leave. I want to. I want you to take us through one moment, and then we'll let you go here. I want you to take us through to put a little, you know, smile on anyone that's listening to this. Take us through the moment where you first saw your wife after the crash and what that was like for you, because you, you just detailed it beautifully, all your emotions from beforehand to during to after. And you said you were in two different hospitals, but what was the moment like? And there is a video for people that want to see it. Make sure to go watch it. What was that moment like for you in your own words when you finally saw your wife for the first time after the crash? Man, I, it, you know, if, if you, if you two, if, I, I assume, I assume you, you guys are married or at least one of you guys are married. You know, like, <laughs> I know <laughs> he, he, he's married. I'm not okay. married. Okay. And, um, you know, the biggest thing I can like, I can compare it to is just, um, when your wife's walking down the aisle or that first, uh, that first sight of seeing them in their wedding dress. Um, I think that was, that's the biggest thing I can compare it to. You know, I just, I walked in there and just like, even though she had, you know, 17 staples on her head and scratches and bruises and stuff, man. She looked just like that day. And man, it just, it just brought a huge smile on my face. Like, gosh, man, I, I thought I lost you, man. And, and, and you, now I'm here with you and, and I get to, you know, come over there and give you a big old hug and a kiss and just let you know that, you know, even though we couldn't control that, but I'm going to try my best to not let anything hurt you like that again. So, Gosh, yeah, it was that. That was a that was a moment that I'll never forget. And I'm sorry, I'm she's cleaning right now. Um, but um, yeah, that was a moment I could never forget. To compare it, just like just like her walking down the aisle, man, it was just something that that you just that you just got to experience on that day. And um, man, it was it was awesome. I that was that was probably the 
the best part of it all is just, you know, reuniting, you know. There was a reason why we selected you for this podcast this week at this time, because we wanted people to hear your story, not just what you've done on the football field, but what you and Cassidy, Cassidy have been able to overcome and uh, what you've experienced. And because uh, I think you provide a lot of hope for people who are enduring struggles and it's also um a good uh lesson for people in terms of hey it, it, it might not look good right now but you got a chance you always got a chance and uh i think you have a lot of fans in jets nation harvey uh it, not just by the way you play but the way you conduct yourself off the field as well i appreciate that and um yeah anyone out there that's that's watching this or listening to this man just just know that there's always light at the end of the tunnel and, you know, just keep on going because if you do, you know, tough times don't, the tough times don't last, but tough people do, you know, so. That, well, that is the perfect way to end this edition of the official Jets podcast with Harvey Longy. Harvey, appreciate the time, man. Hey, I appreciate you guys. Appreciate Jets Nation, uh-huh. guys. We got a dub. <laughs> let's go get another one. Let's finish this. Let's finish this season strong, guys. Just stay with us. Keep keep supporting us, man. Just know your boys are out here working, and we love you guys. Appreciate it. Great stuff from Harvey, as always. Very nice guy, and a great guy to have on the official Jets podcast. EA, let's turn the table here real quick. As the Jets now coming off a cross country flight home, big win. Now take on the Cleveland Browns, who will be playing at MetLife Stadium for a second consecutive week. Uh, the Browns were impressive from Sunday night football. The Giants trying to stick, uh, trying to stay in that NFC East race. And that uh, was really a route. I mean, they physically manhandled them pretty, pretty well. And we were talking about that run game. Uh, the Browns bring it on the ground as well as anybody in the National Football League. Um, you know, we always think about Tennessee and what they're doing with Derrick Henry, but there's kind of a two headed monster there in Cleveland with Nick Chubb. And then you're also bringing in Kareem Hunt. And Baker Mayfield has kind of went under the radar a little bit. And this is a cautionary tale for everybody, okay? When we evaluate quarterbacks, I think a lot of people early in the season or after what happened last year, they were ready to write Baker Mayfield off. And now he's sitting there. He hasn't turned the football over a lot. Uh, he's playing winning football, connecting on a lot of his passes. And the the Browns are going to the playoffs. They're down in four. <laughs> yeah, the Browns turnaround happened real quick, and I think it's a great point about Baker. And let's just dive into this matchup a little more with Bart Scott for our Victorinox Swiss Army Knife Player of the Game segment. Okay, Bart, so kick us off here. Who's your player to watch when the Jets host the Browns on Sunday? I mean, for me, it's definitely going to be, I know as you say this every week, but I, I want to see just how good this kid is on his first season. I want to see how Beckton can handle Miles Garrett. Miles Garrett is, to me, the most complete um, pass rush in the game, meaning that he's a guy that can beat you with size, speed, strength, athleticism. And I think he poses a, a, a problem for Beckton because he's not just one dimensional. He's a guy that can do multiple things. He can long arm him. He has great with his hands. He can bend at the hips. And he's explosive and powerful. Uh, call it the, the class of the Titans. So I want to see, you know, he passed the test. I think he manhandled. Donald a little bit, but Donald is a lot smaller, a lot shorter um, than, than, than that of, of Gary, who's on the edge, not in the middle. Let me go to the other side of the ball, Ethan. Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, two-headed monster. Chubb is averaging 5.6 yards a carry, guys. He's got 10 touchdowns. But as Bart and I were just discussing, the Jets' strength defensively predominantly is stopping the run. So if you stop the run, what are you going to do against Baker Mayfield? Mayfield, over the last four weeks, 1,200 yards passing, 10 touchdowns, and one interception. He's protecting the football. So my matchup to watch is Baker Mayfield against the Jets. Young, improving secondary. How about Bryce Hall last week with the acrobatic interception? Javelin Guidry is showing me stuff at the nickel position. And the Jets have moved Arthur Millette, a former cornerback, to safety to play alongside Marcus May, the constant presence. So I'm going to go away from the run game. Let's see if the Jets can 
play even against the Browns. The Browns are going to get their yardage on the ground. But I think for the Jets to win, they got to come up with a couple takeaways of Baker Mayfield. Bart, before I give my matchup to watch, I'm just curious, what's your take on Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, and that Browns rushing attack against this Jets defense, which to EA's point, their strength is stopping the run. Well, I mean, you think about, you know, the Browns have been able to run on pretty much everybody. Nick Chubb, if he didn't get injured early in the season, would have probably been tops, even with Derrick Henry, what he's been able to do consistently. He'd have been right up there with uh, the, for the rushing title. But I think what you really have to worry about is not, you know, their rushing attack so much. Um, I think you're going to have to worry about Kareem Hunt split out at wide receiver, his ability to make running backs, I mean, linebackers miss. And if he goes out there, you you better put a guy like Arthur or you got to better put a guy like uh, Marcus May out there. Do not let that linebacker go out there and be matched up against Kareem Hunt because he's done it time and time again, week in and week out with going against some of these linebackers. He may not look like he's the shiftiest or fastest, but he's a guy that just finds a way to get open, and he's great with catching the football in the air, high point and catching with his hands and making guys pay. So my matchup to watch, I'm going with the other 2018 draft class quarterback and Sam Darnold in this matchup. Baker Mayfield selected number one overall. Sam Darnold selected number three overall. EA and I were talking about this offline, that it seemed like Sam Darnold was very decisive, perhaps his most decisive game as a quarterback in the 2020 season, even though you look at his numbers, not gaudy by any stretch of the imaginations. Maybe this week against the Browns defense, the Browns secondary, that's been solid, I would say, perhaps mediocre, that Denzel Mims, Brashad Perriman can potentially poke some holes in that secondary, and maybe Sam Darnold can keep the Jets or give the Jets an opportunity to win this game with his arm. So we'll see what happens. Bart, what's your take on the Browns secondary before we wrap this segment up here? I mean, Ward just got back last week. Um, he's a guy that when he's playing, he's one of the better uh, cornerbacks in the game. He's competitive, he's scrappy. Um, what you have to be careful of is last week they were able to get the ball out of Sam's hands in under two seconds. Let's see if they're able to do that now that if the if the Browns decide to sit on these routes and flat foot and say, if you're going to beat us, you're going to beat us throwing over top of our head. Um, they're going to have to make sure that the game plan is able to be um, liquid. Make sure that the game plan is able to be able to transfer for if it's not working to be able to go to something else. Because if you think that what happened last week or what was successful last week isn't going to get scouted and the Jets aren't going to walk up on anybody, nobody's going to look at them as a um, a, a winless team. They're going to look at them as a team that they don't want to lose to in a pivotal time in the season where they need wins and they're trying to jockey for position and try not to be the last wild card entry and potentially maybe when they play this, the Steelers have an opportunity to win a division. I just want to add here. The fans, listen to Bart. He thinks the Chicago Bears could be tripped up by the Jacksonville Jaguars on Sunday. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you know, you know, that team is ready for a market correction. They they really um, benefited from Montgomery tough running inside. Jacksonville Miles Miles Jack is an outstanding inside linebacker. Let's see if he comes to play. And um, let's see what you know, if Minshew Mania decides to go out and understand that, hey, man, they're trying to replace me. So let me go in here and make sure that I put up a best effort. This is a team that had the, the uh, Minnesota Vikings on the ropes and took them to overtime and had an opportunity to win that game. And uh, I think, you know, right now, Mr. Trubisky's been playing well. Um, with that being said, it's about time for a market correction for him. Two weeks left coverage. in the season, Ethan. Yep. Well, yeah. What was that? I said two weeks left in the season. Plenty can change. We know that. No doubt. And like I said, a little bonus coverage here on the Victorinox Swiss Army Knife Player of the Game segment. That's all we have here on the official Jets podcast powered by Amazon Web Services. Bart, thanks a lot as always. And we got one more of these. I appreciate it.